This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this episode, Jonathan is checking out the wasteland weaponry of Fallout 4. This this particular site with two screws coming in from either side to form like a crude reticle really makes zero sense. There's no point having a scope tube if there's no glass in it, it's not magnifying, it's not achieving anything. If you want to see more of Jonathan's thoughts on the firearms of Fallout, make sure to check out our videos on both Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas, and be sure to subscribe for more videos just like this one. If there are any other games, guns, and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comment section below. And if you'd like to help out the Royal Armies Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. I find the 10mm pistol in the Fallout games a bit of a quirky thing. I, I quite like the design, it's a little bit reminiscent of the Blade Runner blaster, which of course has its own place in, in the franchise in a way. It's got some extraneous greeblies on it. Um, there are two parallel levers either side that, as the slide comes to the rear, um, those levers drop. So they're operating something, or they are being operated by the slide, and presumably they are doing something inside. I could not tell you what that is. They seem to be just there for visual interest. Movement detected. Curious. Actuate or damage. The laser musket. Is it a musket? I suppose it's, it's a musket in the sense that it's used by the uh, Neo Minutemen organization and that it's slow to fire and it's clunky. So it, it's a sort of spiritual musket. Of course, it's not a musket in any meaningful technical sense because it's using uh, laser energy, even though you're using muscle power to crank that up, to somehow store up energy in the capacitor to actually fire it. Aesthetically, the only real nod to the musket is, I suppose, the extended rod that holds the sort of emitter is reminiscent of, of a long barrel of a musket, and the wooden buttstock and the big trigger guard sort of look a bit oldy worldy. Um, I've seen people compare it to the Pennsylvania or Kentucky rifle, and yeah, there's that War of Independence connection there with the Minutemen organization, but those guys are just as likely, if not more likely, to be using French or British muskets or their own fouling pieces, not necessarily a rifle. Although some of the concept art had quite a Kentucky rifle buttstock, the final version doesn't. So for me, it's not really there as a laser version of the Kentucky rifle. Some pretty clear uh, Papasha submachine gun heritage to this combat rifle, which is clearly meant to be a, a sort of an alternative reality Browning automatic rifle. I say clearly, I think so. Or the initial caliber it's available in, 45, which as we can see from the casings is literally 45 ACP. That's a bit weird. The magazine is still a full length, a full depth rifle type magazine, but it's firing, and it's a huge, long, heavy gun, but it's firing a pistol cartridge. That doesn't make a lot of sense. We've got a, a bayonet hanging rather unsecurely from, insecurely from the barrel. The thing about bayonet mounts is that they must have a secure, robust mounting system because you are jamming them into people. That mount, it's not even a mount really, is it? It's just the, um, the guard of the, of the bayonet somehow is attached to the barrel. That bit of metal is so thin and there's such a lever there, it, that thing is gonna bend. Um, and for a, what is really quite, a, or at least with the, up, with the upgraded full caliber version, quite a heavy, powerful weapon, you don't typically put a bayonet on that anyway. Another curious design, the so-called assault rifle. It's not super clear to me in what way this is a, an assault rifle. I mean, you can upgrade it to be automatic, but it doesn't come automatic. By definition, it couldn't be an assault rifle because an assault rifle must be um, automatic capable. None of the, I don't think any of the automatic capable guns in the game come as automatic. You have to find a, a specific receiver to allow that, which isn't quite how that works, but um, we'll overlook that. So let's assume that it's an automatic version and it's in 5.56. Yeah, it's a form of an assault rifle, but what is with the gigantic cooling jacket? Which is itself a, a puzzle because it's clearly based on the Lewis gun's cooling 
jacket, which is an air cooling jacket, it's a radiator essentially, inside an outer sheath. The lighter coloured flanges at the back there are the inner aluminium radiator that sits around the barrel and then it has a, a basically a heat shield over that, partly to protect the user, but primarily for, to allow this um, interesting forced cooling system where the muzzle gases pull cold air in through those veins at the back and over the barrel to cool it. Very clever, interesting system. It's the only gun that I'm aware of that did that, and it's on this assault rifle. This also has a filling port at the back for water and a big old bit of plumbing hanging off the bottom of it that goes somewhere under the gun and does something. So on the face of it, it's actually a water jacket, but that doesn't seem to factor into how it's actually used in the game. So it's a weird mashup of Lewis gun, and then it's got aspects of, weirdly, the Minimi light machine gun. So that lower receiver slash handguard is visually based upon the Minimi's handguard, and the buttstock looks to be reminiscent of the collapsing buttstock on the Minimi as well, although you have to kind of squint. So kind of a kind of a cool Star Wars style visual mashup of guns from different periods in, in our own history. So this is what's, what's uh, sometimes known as a Gauss gun or Gauss rifle, as it is in this case. Same thing as a coil gun, which is using electromagnetic coils to accelerate a solid projectile, like a bullet, to uh, often extremely high velocities to achieve very high penetration, sort of splash damage on armour, that kind of thing. We have those in the real world that are the size of vehicles. The energy requirements are such that you cannot produce a shoulder-fired version like this, and there's no real prospect short of like, miniature fusion reactors, <laughs> which of course we have here, of being able to achieve that. So it's um, very much a, very much a sci-fi thing, as are all of those. Partly part of the, the aesthetic of this that I, that I enjoy and makes it seem very alternate Cold War are the digits on the the readout on the back of the gun, which look like sort of um, vacuum tube old style readouts, which is which is cool. Um, as well as the uh, the copper wire coils and the capacitor slash valve things, there's a lot of visual interest going on here, even if it's not a believable design. One of the real-world firearms, of course, is the 44 pistol, which is a pretty good copy of this thing, the Smith & Wesson Model 29. Uh, this one has a, a, an excessively long barrel. Those of us of a certain age will think Dirty Harry. Now, something I've noticed this time that I've not while playing the game is they've gone to the trouble of modelling the notch in the top of the hammer, if you look at it in first-person view which is actually meant to house this replaceable firing pin. Replaceable because they can break and it's cheaper to replace just that bit than the whole hammer. And that's missing from this model. So um, either the gun they had for reference or the image they had was missing the firing pin, quite possible, or they just didn't notice it. But um, as, as depicted, there's nothing to actually fire the cartridge. I will say I don't think there's enough recoil modeled in this with this thing, certainly relative to the other handguns, it's recoiling in a pretty similar way. Um, I mean, Clint Eastwood used to almost over-exaggerate, mine the recoil of this thing, but at least it implied that it was firing something potent. We don't see anything like that here. The player must have uh, wrists of steel, I think, because this is a 44 Magnum is an old cartridge, but it's still really quite powerful. Something new to Fallout 4 was this whole kind of ecosystem, um, a marketing person might call it, of pipe weapons. So guns built around the idea of readily available steel pipes that would be lying around the destroyed world. Good idea, not the first time we've seen it, but uh, an interesting implementation of it. A lot of the designs are not 
tremendously plausible though there's there's been more attention to the aesthetics than to how they would actually function if they were real but it does it, it appeals in terms of the ability to change their appearance and how they function by bolting different bits on it kind of makes sense, intuitive sense that you could do that so here we've got the uh, 308 handgun which is never a good idea that's a tremendous amount of recoil to be contained by a handgun least of all one that's been assembled from hardware store components so I, I don't fancy this much with or without the big jagged spike sticking to the front of it Although in keeping with the rusty aesthetic of these guns, the sight, this, this particular sight with two screws coming in from either side to form like a crude reticle really makes zero sense. Uh, there's no point having a scope tube if there's no glass in it, frankly. It's not magnifying, it's not achieving anything. Um, you're not even getting a fixed point of aim that you could calibrate, you could zero. The gap between the points of the misaligned screws is really not going to help you aim very much at all. Better than nothing, but not much. You'd be far better off trying to put a single screw on the front of the barrel and probably calling it a day there, at least giving you some sort of aiming reference point. Bigger issue for this rifle is the feed setup. So we've got this side mounted magazine, then we've got the much bigger issue that the geometry of that magazine well doesn't work. It, it's significantly below the level of the bolt, so there's no way for the bolt to pick up around and feed it. So there's, there's not, not, this hasn't been quite thought through. So this, so the reason we've got this redundant locking piece screwed to the side of the of the gun is that this is meant to be the same basic gun that you are adapting into different roles. I can't remember if it quite works that way in the game or not, but it's the, yeah, it's the same piece of wood, it's the same metal plates and stock, and even the same bolt, even the same locking thing. So you are, we're expected to believe that we are effectively ch uh, turning a bolt action into an automatic weapon without really changing anything like as much as we would have to to accomplish that, and vice versa. So with this uh, scoped version here that's firing 50 caliber ammunition, okay, we are now locking the, the literal bolt, bolt handle, into the locking wedge shoulder thing that's hanging off the side of the gun. That's a nod to the fact that this is a bolt action and would need to be manually locked shut for firing, but there's no way that this thing is gonna take the, the chamber pressures of 50 Browning machine gun. As, as you know, my job title is Keeper of Firearms and Artillery. I am responsible for the artillery collection here at the Royal Armouries, so it's quite gratifying to see a take on a piece of artillery in a game, and especially the admittedly silly fantasy conceit of a man-portable cannon. It's got pneumatic recoil dampeners in it, which is a nice try. I don't think they would be sufficient to take the, the recoil of a, an actual cannon. The design of the gun itself isn't really historically correct. It's got the lines of a traditional cannon. Yeah, the profile's not really correct for any particular era or country. It has got the British Royal Cipher, appears to be GR, so uh, one of the Georges, uh, would complete with the crown, of course. The actual practicalities of using this, again, so the recoil would still be too much, dampened or not. And what's supposed to happen is you hold that sort of armature in place and, as you can see, the gun itself pivots downward to give access to the muzzle for reloading. Big problem there is we're not putting any gunpowder in our gunpowered powered gun. So we're just putting the projectile in there, no propellant, which is obviously a problem because nothing would happen. Another gun from this game that I'm not familiar with, I believe it's a DLC thing, but I am familiar with it because although it's called the Radium Rifle and 
inexplicably fires radioactive ammunition. It's actually a pretty close copy of this, the Volkssturmgewehr. It's a very interesting design for a number of ways, a number of reasons. None of those involve radioactive bullets. So this thing was, uh, n nor was any, as far as I know, Second World War firearm designed to fire radioactive bullets. The closest we've ever come is depleted uranium, which is called depleted uranium for a reason. It may not be entirely safe, but it is not intended to insert radiation into its target. So why have they chosen this as the basis for that rifle? Your guess is as good as mine. It's probably worth noting that this does seem to have been adapted for the purpose. So whatever, whatever those various electrical bits and bobs do to irradiate the ammunition, it does seem that this is a, modifi a modification, an improvisation, adaptation from a real gun. So we could be looking at somehow, rather far in the future, a very rare last ditch wartime gun that has been adapted for radioactive purposes. I say this not only because it looks like it's been ad adapted, but because you can't use the sights. They haven't actually modeled the front sight post anyway, but you can't even see the front sight assembly because whatever that is is attached over the top of the barrel. So you are not actually able to aim properly with it, which would suggest that this has been modified and the modification is deemed more important than the ability to hit anything. So, second time in a row for the semi-famous Shovel AK. We covered this in Rust last time. Yes, that is a spade grip on the back of that Kalashnikov. So, back in 2008, there was a, uh, a chap who was inspired to make his own Kalashnikov, which was legal for him to do where he was. He not only put the uh, literal spade grip on the back of the receiver, the receiver itself was forged by him from the blade of the same shovel. This is a, a riff on essentially a, a meme, but it's a real gun. We've also got a horrific looking tanto bladed monster of a utility knife, I suppose you might, or tactical knife you might call it, that is um, inadequately secured to the muzzle of this thing. The real standout for me, other than all of that, is this is a Kalashnikov in a Fallout game. And like many, Fallout slash gun nerds, I was given to understand that there was no Kalashnikov in the Fallout universe and that its alternative reality equivalent was the Chinese assault rifle. So this is quite the bombshell for, for the likes of me for the Kalashnikov to now be canon in the Fallout universe. The Institute I made a point of getting my hands on one of these because it was new and interesting. It's a slightly more sci-fi take on a Fallout energy weapon. For me, it's also perhaps inspired by the likes of Weta Workshop, who've done some amazing work with sci-fi weapons of all kinds. The back end is quite reminiscent of, if you've seen the Tomorrow War, the AR-15s in that were equipped with Hera Arms furniture, so this style of blocky thumbhole buttstock, quite similar to that. I'm always amused by super high-tech weapons that have not only iron sights when you would expect something, oh no, clearly this is an, an opportunity to upgrade your weapon in, in this case, not only iron sights but super basic iron sights that look like I made them with some tin snips. Really kind of detracts from the overall sci-fi look of the, of the weapon. Do go over and check out the Royal Armouries YouTube channel as well as the rest of this one. We also have got link, links in the description for ways to donate to the museum if you'd like to do that. Or my book on British bullpup firearms, which has been out for a, for a while now and is still available via head stamp, is also now available from the Royal Armouries shop, um, which is better for people who are located on this side of the globe. So if you're interested, check that out as well. But um, otherwise, we'll see you next time. <laughs>